explanation. Lord, we would never be able to understand and really live in your word without the power of your spirit in our minds and hearts. So shine your light into us now. Help us to hear and then to go and do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first reading this morning is from Proverbs 16, 2 through 9, and 20. All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. The Lord works out everything for his own ends, even the wicked for a day of disaster. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. Though love and faithfulness sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, a man avoids evil. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. And this is the word of God. Just give you pull my volume down just a little notch there. Thank you. Our second scripture this morning is from the book of James, one of my favorites. He writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such, quote, wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from God is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, you know, most of us have periods in our lives when things just kind of seem intolerable. Maybe there's a strain in our relationships, and the marriage, or with the kids, kids who are young or old enough to know better. Maybe there's a person at work that has become a real pain. And if it's the boss, that creates his own set of problems. Maybe there's been a downturn in your finances or like an unexpected car accident or a business development that suddenly shuts off a source of income. Could be a health problem that arises. Suddenly, life isn't as well-ordered and enjoyable as it was before. Life can unravel amazingly quickly sometimes, and everything can feel like a burden. You look around you and it just all seems like a mess. You begin to find yourself losing important papers or keys. You get rude with people on the phone when you're inconvenienced, you gotta wait on hold too long. You maybe get short with your family. You just feel confused and angry sometimes. You look at a desk full of bills and papers and the, the TV chair looks better and better. You start to understand why people start drinking or taking too many pills because life can be kind of overwhelming at times. We just read from Proverbs 16, commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. That's really powerful. It's so powerful that I want to say it again, the way it appears in the King James Version. He says, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. I like that way. So as I said earlier, we start our day out and say, Lord, I just give you my day. Whatever you need me to do, I'll do. If I find that I need strength, please give it to me. 
Help me to hear from you when I need to put aside what I was planning to do to take up something that you're going to lead me to do. If we honestly see each day, each hour as a gift from God to be lived in relationship with Him, we're going to see more opportunities to live for Him. We're going to be less rattled by the distractions and the inconveniences that always crop up. We'll be kind of like a car with good shock absorbers. We'll just sort of ride over the bumps better. When we start each day with the Lord, He will begin to order our lives and He'll help us to focus on the important things. I think that we'll be less clutter because we're more certain about what we ought to undertake. We'll finish what we start and we'll not even begin things that we know He doesn't want us to do. Life just feels less frantic and confusing when we accept the guidance and the protection of the Lord who is our creator and sustainer. Proverbs 24 said, I went past the field of a sluggard, that's a lazy person, a distracted person. He said, I passed the vineyard of a man who lacks judgment. Thorns had come up everywhere, and the ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed, and I learned a lesson from what I saw. You know, everywhere you serve in ministry, you have a group of people who have a certain culture, a certain understanding. Uh, I remember preaching on this one time back in Detroit, and I had to kind of explain the whole idea of managing a vineyard, and people could sort of picture what an untended vineyard would look like, but then I served the church in Fowler, California. The whole town was surrounded by vineyards. That's raisin country. Every raisin you've ever eaten is probably grown within 20 miles of that town. So they knew exactly what an untended vineyard looked like. I remember one guy talking about, well, he's having some problems, and you can sort of tell because the place looks like a shambles. It's no secret when everybody in town can drive by and see the state of your mind reflected in a field. But some of the messes that people can make in their lives are obvious, like a dried up vineyard. And uh, you know that we've seen those posters of what people look like when they get on meth uh, six months or so, and they, it's very disturbing. They, they show these attractive people, and then they look like 40 years older. They have sores on their faces, kind of a vacant, lost look in their eyes. It's very hard to hide when you're like, it's that out of control. But sometimes, though, people can be a real mess, and it doesn't show like an untended vineyard. But the mess is just as real. We've all heard, after some horrible crime, they interview the neighbors, remember? And they, they say, well, yeah, he seemed like an okay guy. Kept to himself, he was nice, quiet, always kept his lawn mowed. Nothing showed on the outside. Some of the messes in life only seen, uh, are only seen behind closed doors. Kind of like rage against loved ones or out of control debt or a thought life that's given over to the lust of the eye. A person can still drive a nice clean car and can dress well. And they can have their hair cut stylishly. They can appear to have it all together. And yet in their heart of hearts, it's a mess because they've drifted away from their creator and sustainer. They're trying to do things their own way, making their own rules, deliberately going against God's ways and his law. Contrast that life that's out of control due to sin, a life that's a mess, either in ways that we can all see or in ways that uh, the person carries around hidden. Contrast that with the life that we see in our passage from James. He said, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who should sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. I love those words. It's hard to hide qualities like these when a person is really walking with the Lord. People can just sense when a person is truly filled with the fruits of the Holy Spirit and they come to them for advice frequently. They watch them. They want to be like them. There's a passage in the book of Ephesians that also talks about the wisdom that comes from God, how a person's life begins to look when they receive that wisdom and the kind of fruit that results. Here's what Paul said. 
We have not stopped asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Lord. So these scriptural passages talk about the kind of life we're called to live as Christians. They're based on achieving wisdom, which we know is a gift from God. The Bible teaches that wisdom equals obedience to God's laws. I'm going to repeat that. The Bible teaches that wisdom equals obedience to God's law. We're wise if we live the way that God created us to live, the way that he requires us to live. And when we stray from that, when we think we're going to have more fun, actually, in fact, our lives are going to get messier and messier until they're out of control. God brings order into our thoughts and our spirits. And this can be reflected in the way we even keep up our surroundings, even the way we carry ourselves. Now, some of you may think I might be pointing my finger at you because you've got some dirty dishes in your sink from Thursday. <laughs> Or maybe your laundry room is piling up to your ears. Or the bathroom sink may need uh, a desperate need for uh, coming in contact with a sponge. You might be saying that I'm saying, I'm, I'm sorry, you may be thinking that I'm telling you that you're a desperate sinner because your housework isn't completely in order. Or your desk looks like it needs a name, like they name hurricanes. I'm not saying that. Of course, most of us who are in couples, both working, uh, it's, you're doing a pretty good job just to function at a basic level day by day. A fabulously neat home with all the silver polish and all the crystals shined up. Maybe that's something ahead, like in retirement. Of course, you retired folks, you're all weeks ahead on your housework, I'm sure, right? <laughs> no, the kind of orderliness I'm talking about isn't strictly about the state of your housework. Of course, most of us have seen that hoarder show. We recognize that sometimes there can be complex psychological issues that God can heal. Of course, the guys kid me because I'm so particular about how I arrange these chairs every week uh, for Sunday mornings. They, they think I'm obsessive, compulsive like that guy on TV, Monk. Maybe there's another psychological issue there. But I just want the house of the Lord to be orderly and neat so that it doesn't distract from our worship of Almighty God. I kind of feel like I'm a temple priest keeping this place looking nice uh, during the week, straightened up. Yeah, that's, that's part of my job, I think. But anyway, I can take the kitty. But as I say, when we walk with the Lord, uh, there can be an orderliness that generally begins to characterize our life. And it goes beyond the condition of our laundry room. It has to do with our mental and emotional and spiritual state. When we're walking with the Lord, we don't have to live frantically. We're doing this and that aimlessly. We're not as easily drawn into things that will waste our time and energy where we have to backtrack later. Our plans come from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Remember it said, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. If the Lord gave you the plan, it's going to work out. But not always the first time, and not always without some challenges along the way at times. Rick Warren in the Purpose Driven Church book says that if a church doesn't have any failed programs, they're not trying enough things. We attempt to hear from the Lord and then we might try something. Sometimes it works perfectly right out of the box. Other times it doesn't fly quite as anticipated, so we refine it, maybe try it again. Or it morphs into something else that then succeeds fabulously. We don't always know if we've heard from the Lord precisely, so we need to try something and then evaluate. And over time, his purposes get established till we get closer and closer to his will. As we're going, we don't panic if a hundred people don't show up for some class that we're offering. Sometimes things start up slow and then they build up. We tried a couple of years ago to have a Sunday evening prayer and praise service, and we gave it a few months, and only a half a dozen people or so were showing up. So eventually the session and I figured that, well, maybe this was an attempt to scratch an itch that nobody was having. So we pulled the plug on that and moved on. Other things we've tried to work out great. The bike days have been very good. 
very innovative idea that I've never seen in any other church that I've served. Our involvement in Hope of Christmas uh, is always a great success. Our men's and women's Bible studies are very well attended. And our first men's breakfast yesterday had all four tables filled up with guys, so uh, that was a success. Great fellowship. So we put all our plans in the Lord's hands, and He brings the success if it's His will. I would ask you today, do you have any plans that involve the Lord in your life? You think He's calling you to take on something new? Many of us today uh, here in this room have business plans that we're praying will be successful. Harry and Tina have launched their own construction business. Greg is uh, working to get a counseling practice established. The Drakes have a building that they're hoping will find some new tenants. The Lord knows that we need financial income to function in this world, and He does provide. But as I say, we have to stay close to Him at all times. In the spiritual realm, has the Lord planted a plan in your heart lately? Maybe He's inspired you to, uh, to start one of those Read the Bible in a Year programs. My dad has done that three or four times and really benefited from it. He felt like God told him to do this, and he did it. Maybe he's whispered in your ear uh, that you ought to contribute a portion of a big windfall that you receive. Maybe he's just given you the urge to start attending church every single week or whatever. If he puts something in your mind, how are you going to respond? He's promised to make your plans succeed if you're truly committed to him. Our passage said, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. He has something in mind for you, but you've got to seek his mind. You've got to listen for his voice. And then when he inspires you in some way, you've got to take the ball and see if you can run with it. When you see your life as a response to God's grace, things start to line up, I find. You begin to find the time to act on this holy inspiration that you get. You get time to clean out the drawers and find all those papers and file them. You start to want to take things uh, and get them in order. God isn't saying to us that we've got to become workaholics or compulsive organizers. I heard the other day about a dad who was working 60 or 70 hours a week at his office, always bringing home work at night. And his first grade son saw him lugging his laptop and a couple of overstuffed briefcases in one night. And he said, the little son said, Dad, why do you have to bring all that stuff home every night? And the dad said, well, son, there's just so much work, I can't finish it all in the workday. The first grader thought a minute and they said, well, why don't they then just put you in a slower group? <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, God isn't calling us to be compulsive work problems, but he is calling us to be diligent and to let him bring order into our lives. If things look like they're not lighting up, lining up for you, pray. And then watch to see what he's going to do to get your life moving in the right direction. He will bring order out of chaos and hope when there is no hope. He's just like that. When God created the universe, it said he brought order out of chaos. He created a world that's in a very delicate balance. Of course, it's human sin that has brought imbalance and chaos and ugliness into it. The devil destroys and disrupts and makes everything crazy and upsetting. That is not the Holy Spirit. Look at the aftermath of a tornado or an earthquake in this fallen creation. Look at a city after a war. All the order is destroyed for a time. The devil loves disorder and chaos. He tries to wreak havoc in our families and in our friendships too. But our God is a God of order and peace and beauty. And the more time we spend in his presence, the more we reflect these qualities. So if your life feels disordered and chaotic today, I say seek the Lord's peace and his power to transform and restore. He is the God that created order out of chaos. And he can do that in your heart and mind too. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, if there is somebody here today who's just feeling out of control, their life is spinning around and they just can't get a handle on things, I pray, Lord, that you would move by the power of your spirit into these situations to 
to show them what step needs to be taken next, one step after the other. I do pray, Lord, that you would help us to be people of peace, to reflect the fruits of your Holy Spirit, peace and patience and joy and kindness and all of those, self-control. Help us, Lord, to look at the messy desk or the messy closet and just say, I'm going to bring that into order today. We want to do this not so that we will look like we've got it all together, but so that you would help us to have peace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.